Okay, I think we're ready to start. And uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this session. Uh, enjoy the view. Let emergency preparedness be your guide. I'm Todd Smith. I'm the senior level advisor for emergency preparedness and incident response at the NRC. We have a great session for you this afternoon. But before we get going, I have a few housekeeping items. We expect to have some time for your questions at the end, and we're also going to be making use of a lot of live polling through this session. So if you could please, uh, right now, scan the QR code that's displayed, or log in through the app and join our session. Uh, if you're logging through the app, you'll find the QA and the live polling questions uh, tabs for you to use. If you've joined us virtually, to the right of your screen, you should also find tabs for the live polling and QA. For those of you in the room, when we display the live polling questions, there will be a, a number option for you to text to 22333. That's 22333. While you're logging in, I would like to take a moment to introduce our panelists because we have a fantastic uh, lineup of subject matter experts to talk to you today. Joining me on stage is Eric Schrader. Eric's an emergency preparedness specialist at the NRC. Mr. Schrader has over 40 years of experience in nuclear power encompassing areas of on-site and off-site emergency preparedness. Eric was also a reactor operator on nuclear submarines. Edward Robinson is a senior emergency preparedness specialist leading advanced and new reactor licensing at the NRC. He has extensive licensing experience, and among his many achievements are many first-of-a-kind application reviews. Captain Janice McCarroll is a United States Public Health Service Officer assigned to the Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency. She is the Senior Public Health Advisor for the Office of National Exercises and Technological Hazards, and Captain McCarroll is currently focused on the National Resilience Mission. And then joining us virtually is Mr. Ken Evans. Ken has spent over 43 years in emergency planning, having recently retired as the head of the Radiological Emergency Assessment Center for the Illinois Emergency Management Agency. Ken is also involved in the Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors, having served as the chair of the HSER5 Committee on Emergency Response and Planning. And in addition, Ken teaches an online graduate course in emergency response for Illinois Institute of Technology. And we also have with us Courtney Eckstein. She's the Radiation Program Director for the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Courtney is the state liaison for 11 counties involved in ingestion pathway planning and response. Prior to her current role, Courtney worked in healthcare. And one note I wanted to pull out of Courtney's bio, she, she noted that her change in career to emergency preparedness has been both challenging and amazing, and it's given her a newfound passion for emergency preparedness and radiation safety. And I really like that note because uh, change is good. And uh, change can be viewed by some as difficult, uh, viewed by others as opportunity. And as we heard from our chair yesterday, uh, there's a lot of opportunities ahead of us. But how you adapt to change depends a lot on, on your view of, of change. And, and that's good because in this session, what we're inviting you to do is sit back and enjoy the view for a while as we discuss how we've adapted to change in emergency preparedness. As I mentioned, uh, we are gonna have a number of live polling questions to aid our discussion. Uh, can we have the first question called up, please? These questions are gonna be calling up periodically. Uh, please don't wait for me to read through them to respond. Go ahead and start providing your answers now. Uh, after I read through them, then I will give a little explanation and we will move on. So the first question asks, compliance with the NRC's emergency preparedness regulations provides reasonable assurance that safety goals and quantitative health objectives are met, protective measures can and will be taken in the event of a radiological emergency, public dose will not exceed 10 millisieverts, one rem, total effective dose equivalent over 96 hours, or D, all of the above. Now these are gonna be a little tricky. I'm not promising they're not gonna be hard, uh, but there is a good answer here, and we're gonna be talking about why there's some good answers. And so for this question, uh, the, the, the answer is that Emergency preparedness provides reasonable assurance that protective actions can and will be taken in an emergency. Can we have the next poll question, please? The next question asks, is it true or false? The final rule in 10 CFR 5160, and that's our new rule on emergency preparedness for small modular reactors and other new technologies, is this the first time the NRC has risk-informed EP? So this is asking, what do you understand about uh, our EP regulations. So think about how we regulate in other areas, think about how we implement protective action strategies, and I'm asking is this the first time that we've actually risk informed? And I think many of you are getting the answer that is false. 
In fact, the risk-informed approach to EP goes back many decades, back to the 70s. And they looked at a number of potential bases, including risk-based, uh, probability-based, cost-based, and they decided on a risk-informed approach. Now, in this conference, if we can go back to the slides, please, when I saw the theme as adapting to the changing landscape, it gave me some pause, and I began to wonder, what does that mean, the changing landscape? Because many things are changing. Technology's changing, of course. Um, the, the climate is changing. We're hearing this week, too, you know, the renewed calls for nuclear to combat climate change. The regulatory landscape is changing, and you're hearing about how we're working to become a modern risk-informed regulator. And of course, our technology tools that we use to aid us in decision-making are also changing, and we're working, looking toward tools like artificial intelligence. So as I was preparing for this session, I decided to uh, pull from a tool of, uh, online and ask, what is a changing landscape? And the answer I got is that a changing landscape applies a dynamic, fluid, and unpredictable environment, one that requires adaptation, flexibility, and resilience. So in this session, we're really gonna talk about how our regulations have been adaptable, flexible, and resilient. And to talk a little bit about EP, one way we can think about it is being like bedrock in the changing landscape. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that, as we discussed in the poll question, EP ensures that protective actions can and will be taken. It doesn't matter how the landscape is changing, EP is always there to serve its purpose. And this means that EP is a final independent layer of defense and depth. So as designs change, as we change how we control and operate reactors, as the safety systems that prevent and mitigate accidents evolve, EP is there to serve the purpose of providing dose savings to achieve the objectives of EP. This means EP is risk-informed, which means that it's adaptable to this changing landscape. And so that's the first thing I wanna focus on is how our regulations have adapted. Because last year we published the final rule on emergency preparedness regulations for small modular reactors and other new technologies. And with us now, uh, we have Eric Schrader from our policy oversight branch. And Eric was instrumental in getting this final rule publicized. So Eric, uh, I have up here the slides, the, the major features of the rule. Would you please walk us through and describe uh, this new rule? All right. Um, the major provisions of the final rule and the guidance are made up of a number of parts, a performance-based framework, the current prescriptive regime, beginning in the 80s, focused uh, inspection efforts and licensee efforts on compliance with control of emergency plans and facilities. In the late 90s, the idea of performance being as, as, important, as, as important as compliance, but it gave rise, I'm sorry, it became, in the late 90s, the idea of performance was introduced as being just as important as compliance, which gave rise to the over reactor oversight program, an improvement, but voluntary, and still based on prescriptive regulation. None of the technology inclusive and performance-based regimes, uh, now the technology and inclusive and performance-based regime takes the next step to create an emergency preparedness regulatory framework that focuses inspection efforts and licensee efforts on actual performance competencies, rather than compliance with emergency plans and procedures. Compliance is still required, however, compliance with the requirements will now be demonstrated through effective response and drills and exercise for emergencies and accident conditions. The technology inclusive aspect of the new rule takes a, um, is the flexibility to use the specific facilities technolo technological innovations to the fullest extent in determining the most effective, effective, and effect, effective and efficient method to meet the regulatory requirements, as opposed to a prescriptive requirement defining, on, de defining how they are to be met. Being technology inclusive allows for the new rule to be applicable to a variety of designs and being performance-based puts the emphasis on demonstration of capabilities over the compliance with written plans. There's also a, a hazard analysis that is now part of it for facilities near the site. SMRs and ONTs have the potential to be located close to or with existing reactors, industrial facilities, um, military bases, transportation hubs, or a combination of these facilities. This new potential setup requires additional independent EP considerations of credible hazards. 
that could, that could adversely impact the implementation of emergency plan. The applicant's licensee, the applicant or licensee's EP program must address these hazards. For example, arrangements might be to notify contiguous or nearby facilities regarding a facility emergency, classifying a hazard from another facility that could negatively impact the safe operation of the, of the facility, providing protective actions for other facility personnel or other on-site individuals such as visitors. This hazard analysis is independent of the Part 100 siting analysis, but may be informed by it. Another section of it, or another provision of it, is a scalable plume exposure pathway emergency planning zone. A scalable emergency planning zone is not really a new concept. It's part of a graded approach, which has always been part of the EP. This rule provides a framework for SMR and ONT applicants to develop an EPZ size commensurate to the risk, risk profile of the facility. The difference now is that the applicant develops a technical basis to justify and justify the proposed specific site-specific EPZ size. The justification needs to include the design and licensing information, off-site dose consequences, accident considerations, accident source terms, vision product releases, accident dose characteristics, and considering site-specific meteorology. And lastly is ingestion pathway planning. The existing concept of ingestion pathway planning zone was created in the 70s, a time when planning, a, a time when the infrastructure to identify and remove radiological, radiologically contaminated goods from the food chain was not as well developed as it is today. The new framework requires an emergency plan description of, or reference to, the capabilities to prevent contaminated food and water from entering the ingestion pathway. The ingestion response planning description needs to include the federal, state, local, tribal, or licensee capabilities to support immediate and long-term monitoring, analysis, and interdiction, or embargo if warranted of products that are part of the site of the site's food and water ingestion pathway. Thank you. That, thank you for that overview, Eric. <laughs> that was a, a lot to put in there in one one slide, but uh, you know it's a new rule. But are we really doing anything different in terms of EP? Um, it's really more similar than it is different. The functions of each planning standard that we currently have, the 16 planning standards and the requirements of Appendix E, are basically still included. They're broken up a little different. They're, they're worded a little different. And we now call them emergency response functions and planning activities. Another way to think of this new rule performance-based technology inclusive is that the requirements describe the trip's destination. But the route and what mode of transportation is used, well, that's left up to the traveler. An example would be, and in current regulations specifically require an on-site technical support center, emergency operations facility, as well as the specific communications capabilities And the emergency, um, as well as the testing requirements for communication systems. The new rule, 10 CFR 5160, requires the establishment of an emergency facility or facilities from which effective command and control can be exercised with the capabilities to support the emergency response functions. So using my, my previous analogy, the new rule establishes the destination a facility or facilities for effective command and control. However, what route you wish to take to this destination and what mode of transportation you wish to use is up to you. Uh, thanks for that, Eric. Um, a couple of things you mentioned, you, know, you, you talked about the graded approach to EP, uh, and, I, and I like your analogy of the destination. Can we have our next live polling question up, please? Um, because you, you mentioned this New rule isn't really different from what we do now. Um, a lot of the planning functions are the same. Um, and we apply this a graded approach to EP, but what does that mean? So this question is asking, the graded approach to EP is best described as an approach that uses probabilistic risk assessment uh, to determine acceptable risk, uses the licensing modernization project to develop risk-informed performance-based emergency plans, uses insights from a spectrum of accidents to inform the planning, or uses worst case scenarios for specific facilities to bound the planning. And I see a lot of people have already provided the results, and the answer is C, 
uses insights from a spectrum of, of accidents to inform the planning. Um, I think this gets to the, the, the destination, the how. If we can go back to the slides, please. The key to emergency preparedness is, is understanding uh, your planning basis. And this goes back, again, as Eric said, to the 70s, and it can be summarized uh, succinctly that the planning basis uses the consequences from a spectrum of accidents to scope the planning efforts for the distance to which planning is needed for predetermined prompt protective actions, the time-dependent characteristics of the potential release, and the types of radioactive materials that are released. And so understanding the planning basis gives you this clear view of, of the destination you're trying to reach. And so, Eric, if you wouldn't mind, uh, what's the value in, in, in understanding the planning basis? Uh, the short answer of what the value in understanding the planning basis is it better, in, the better you understand it, the better able you are to be able to construct an emergency plan that is most efficient and effective for your specific facility. And that's, that's a key flexibility of, of the new rule. So understanding that the planning basis doesn't require an exact prediction of all accident sequences and their consequences, only that the basic information on accident types and that are applicable to the facility eases the development of the EP capabilities needed to address them and greatly simplifies implementing them. So understanding what the basis is nicely sets the stage for how to accomplish it and makes the how much easier to understand. The basis begins with a spectrum of accidents, not just one accident type or the worst accident. Planning for a single accident type could lead to gaps in emergency plan capability to deal with uncertainty. Each potential accident will have a unique set of challenges, such as the timing, how quickly the event unfolds, makeup of the source term, what isotopes are being released, and condition of a site, what's the event caused by a hostile action, or, you know, et cetera. Each of these aspects will be used by decision makers to determine what the appropriate protective public action will be. For example, most events that result in a release that exceed EPA PAGs, the Environmental Protection Agency Protective Action Guides, decision makers would evacuate the public in harm's way of the release. However, if the event were caused by a hostile action against the facility, it could create a situation where sheltering the public in place may be the best protective action. By examining the spectrum of, a spectrum of accidents, their characteristics, release timing, magnitude, source term, et cetera, an emergency plan can be developed with capabilities that will be robust, flexible, and able to respond to the situation or uncertainty as to what the accident might be. The ability to deal with the uncertainty is why EP is the final independent layer of defense in depth. Thanks for that, Eric, and uh, really appreciate your overview of the rule. Uh, I, I know it's been a, a, a long road in getting us there to that final rule. And if you're interested, you know, we record these RIC sessions, and if you'd like to review uh, the development of the rule, we did have a session last year setting a course for the future of EP that you can view online. But I think really um, what a lot of us are interested in is learning more about how are we going to implement the new rule. Uh, so now can we call up the next uh, live polling question? The next series of polling questions are to kind of test our knowledge and, and look at some of the features of the new rule. So while the first question comes up, it's asking, the final rule in 10 CFR 5160 does not require the use of probabilistic risk assessment. And that is true. While PRA is a tool that we can use and leverage and, and get risk insights from, it's only one tool in our toolbox. And as you heard um, our office directors talk, if you heard their session this morning, uh, they talked about the use of quantitative and qualitative risk insights. And the rule is very flexible in uh, letting you uh, apply different uh, sources of information. Can we go to the next polling question, please? The next question is asking, the emergency planning zone is not a design feature of the facility. And again, that is true. And we'll talk more about the planning zone. The, the planning zone is a, is a planning tool for the purposes of EP. And next polling question, please. This one's asked, the performance-based approach to EP focuses on performance of safety features to prevent and mitigate accidents, licensee control of emergency plans and procedures, response capabilities and results rather than means, or response capabilities to meet safety goals. I think most of you are getting it. Performance-based is focusing on results and not just means. 
Can we go back to the slides, please? So what we want to talk about now is how the regulation is flexible. So with me on stage is Edward Robinson from our uh, reactor licensing branch. And Eddie, <clears throat> the new requirements in 5160, they're not prescriptive in how to meet a standard. So how does that change uh, the Pennzoil approach to licensing and, and content of application? With the implementation of 5160, um, there's been a slight paradigm shift to how the NRC would traditionally regulate in that 5160 is not prescriptive. Um, it's incumbent upon the applicant to describe how the EP functions will be met and provide an adequate basis to address the specific hazards of the facility. Now it's recognized that a lot of this information is contained in the design documents, but the applicant must consider site-specific aspects to the plan and approach. And this includes things like specific nearby hazards. But the rule is flexible to the license approach of the applicant. For example, while we need information on the characteristics of a spectrum of accident, this does not mean need to come from the PRA. Applicants can use a maximum hypothetical accident, or MHA, during the application review process, the NRC staff also considers aircraft impact scenarios and security event impacts on EP. 5160 continues to provide a flexible regulatory infrastructure similar to the alternative license approach identified in 5047B and Part 50 Appendix E. So today we've heard that 5160, although not prescriptive, provides for a risk-informed framework in which safety requirements and the criteria are set commensurate to the risk of the facility. Under 10 CFR Part 50 Appendix C, the review involves ev evaluation of evidence of preliminary planning, which is a PSAR, or substantial evidence of planning, which could be captured in an FSAR, for emergency preparedness directed at situations involving real or potential radiological hazards. The regulations in 5160 require applicants and licensees to demonstrate effective response in drills and exercises for emergency and accident conditions. At that time, the NRC staff will, one, review the application to determine whether the application has described how the performance-based framework in 5160 will be met, and two, evaluate applications using a graded approach based on site-specific consequence analysis. Uh, thanks for that, Eddie. You know, when I think about our current regulations and, and how long they've been in place, we're fortunate we have many regulatory guides, uh, new regs uh, that describe acceptable methods and how to meet the regulations. We have um, decades of generic communications as well that address uh, particular issues uh, in EP. And then, of course, FEMA, we have a, a well-established off-site uh, radiological emergency preparedness manual. Um, Eddie, what, what can uh, applicants look forward to use in terms of guidance in, in meeting the requirements in 5160? Absolutely. Uh, the new requirements and guidance include recognition of advances in design, technology advances embedded in design features, credit for safety enhancements, and evolutionary and passive systems, and credit for smaller size reactors and non light water reactors' potential benefits associated with postulated accidents. And this includes slower transient response times and relatively small or slow release of materials. Uh, Regulatory Guide 1.242, entitled Performance-Based Emergency Preparedness for Small Modular Reactors, Non-Light Water Reactors, and Non-Power Production or Utilization Facilities, has been crafted to identify methods and procedures the staff of the NRC considers acceptable for use by the applicants and licensees for small modular reactors, non-light water reactors, and utilization facilities to demonstrate compliance with performance-based emergency preparedness requirements in 10 CFR 5160. Again, this reg guide is available and adaptable to suit any technology. This reg guide was issued in November of 2023, and it's publicly available on our NRC, uh, NRC website for those that wish to view it. To facilitate the EP staff's review of applications involving SMRs, non-light water reactors, and other new technologies that choose to adapt an alternative EP framework in 5160, application submittal review guidance is under development. Future public engagements will occur regarding those staff efforts. Ultimately, the message in here is that the NRC EP staff is in the ready for receipt of such application submittals. Thank you, Eddie. Um, EP knowledge 
is really very specialized. And so when we talk about risk-informed approaches to EP, those are different than risk-informed approaches in design. And my next question to you is, um, what can applicants do to best prepare to approach the NRC for licensing? Great question. Um, Pre-application engagements are highly encouraged uh, to ensure a methodical and logical success path forward as it pertains to licensing. Uh, the best way for me to highlight these advantages is to kind of categorically describe the advantages uh, for applicants as compared to the advantages for the NRC. For the applicants, pre-applications engagements result in enhanced regulatory predict predictability, reducing project risk. For the applicant, these preliminary engagements provide for a greater review efficiency because NRC staff becomes familiar with the design, and that efficiency frequently translates to lower costs and shorter review schedules. From an agency perspective, pre-application engagements provide for a greater review efficiency because NRC staff becomes familiar with the preliminary design and pending the assessment type may be able to provide an official agency position on the attributes of the preliminary design review. This official agency position would be documented in a safety evaluation that can be referenced by the applicant in the safety analysis report. Public engagement during the review process is critical. Preliminary engagements between the applicant and the NRC staff afford just that, early public engagement on the attributes of a license in action. These public engagements increase transparency and enhance public awareness of the intended license, license in submittal. Ultimately, the message in here is that the pre-application engagements are highly encouraged and can be helpful to identify technical and regulatory gaps in policy issues. Identifying these items early in the review process results in the application submission of high quality and provides for an efficient review by the agency. For example, NewScale developed an EPZ size and methodology topical report for their facility. This topical report provided for a methodology that will be used to establish the site-specific plume exposure pathway EPZ size at the new scale SMR plant sites. The staff's acceptance of this approach was documented in an SCR dated October of 2022. This is just merely one example of the many pre-engagement efforts which the agency is involved. As it pertains to our EP advance and new reactor efforts, we have seen these pre-application engagements occur approximately six months or more before the intended application submittal date. In summary, 5160 rulemaking is an example of our agency's recognition that technology is advancing and EP is evolving. As a result, the NRC staff anticipates design-specific methodologies may be developed. Nevertheless, our agency's mission to protect the health and safety of the public remains unchanged. Um, I would also like to point out that the NSER DPR, uh, Division of Preparedness and Response, is hosting a digital exhibit. I believe that's at Desk K, if I'm not mistaken, right outside the doors. Uh, the digital exhibit is titled Realizing Performance-Based Emergency Planning. Um, the exhibit further highlights some of the key messages that were already discussed uh, by myself and my colleagues uh, thus far, that those relate to the guidance that is available to support the applicants how performance-based EP regulations lead to defined results without requiring specific direction on how those results are to be obtained, the agency's encouragement of pre-application meetings, and the emphasis of the agency's readiness to license SMRs and ONTs under 5160 should an applicant wish to pursue licensing under that framework. So I encourage you to visit that exhibit as your time permits uh, for those additional details. Uh, thank you for that, Eddie. Yeah, please come see us at, the, at that exhibit. Uh, ask us your questions. And a uh, reminder, uh, as you have questions, go ahead and submit them now. Uh, we'll, we will have time for your questions at the end. Um, but Eric, I want to come back to you for a second because you gave us a great overview of the performance-based aspects of the rule. And in many ways, our, our, our regulations now even are performance-based. And a key part of performance-based is drills and exercises. And drills and exercises are, are unique because that's where you develop and demonstrate that you have the key skills that are needed to implement the EP functions that you talked about. Um, our current regulations, they're, they're prescriptive though in terms of the exercise and the drills that you must conduct. So what is performance-based drills and exercises going to look like uh, in, in under 5160? Um, specifically what they're gonna look like, um, I can't say. That's going to be up to each licensee 
and they'll have the flexibility to determine for themselves the most effective and efficient method to demonstrate their effective response in drills and exercises for emergencies and accident conditions. But what I can say is that we'll need to have one, a performance, performance objective metrics for each of the emergency response functions, an approved method for performance objective development, performance of objective thresholds defining acceptability or successful achievement of each of the emergency response functions, and a drill and exercise performance critique process that demonstrates the licensee's ability to be adequately self-critical in evaluating the emergency response organization performance, identify their performance weaknesses, document the necessary corrective actions, and track metri metric performance. A simple example of what this might look like, though, would be to track emergency response function performance by percentage. What percentage of the time does the ERO successfully demonstrate the emergency response function? To do this, a licensee would create an exercise scenario to demonstrate the effective response to emergency um, and accident conditions. They would count the, um, one of the required emergency response functions is to demonstrate event classification and mitigation, which calls for the capability to assess, classify, monitor, and repair facility malfunctions. So for the event classification mitigation part of this response function, the licensee would count the number of opportunities presented in the scenario, that would be the denominator, and compare it to the number of times the ERO successfully recognized, classified the scenario, and took the expected mitigative actions. That would be the numerator, and then multiply that resultant by 100. Thank you for that example, Eric. Uh, you know, I remember uh, my time in the Navy, uh, we switched to performance-based regimen, and it actually had been very, very helpful because sometimes the advantages of these uh, performance-based approaches aren't really recognizable immediately, but uh, one of the advantages I see with performance-based is that um, when you're doing well in one particular area and function, it allows you to focus your uh, training needs in other areas where you see your performance start to guide. And so overall, you maintain very high levels of performance. And so you know, even under prescriptive approaches and performance base, uh, both achieve very high level of, of performance, which is great. Um, you know, we've been working very hard on this rule for a number of years, uh, and, and now as we implement it, uh, we're looking to also provide oversight. And so how is oversight of performance-based uh, EP, what does that look like for the NRC, and how are we preparing? Well, at, at this point, the process is still under development, so exactly what's going to look like is yet to be determined. However, I think it's safe to say that it'll likely use a very similar philosophy to the current ROP inspection oversight process. We'll establish a minimum baseline inspection that verifies enough of a sample to of the licensee's EP program to continue reasonable assurance. And then when we find a weakness or weaknesses, we'll, 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 we'll apply additional inspection resources will be applied to that, that, that topic. So the current ROP uses a set of voluntary PIs. The rule uses a set of regulatory required performance objectives and metrics, very similar. Each emergency response function is measured by a performance objective metric, and that will be established by the license, that will establish the licensee's response bound. This sounds kind of familiar to the ROP re licensee response bound. Very similar to the current ROP. The new R oversight um, process will likely include, in broad brush strokes, inspection of exercise performance coupled with an evaluation of the licensee's exercise critique process and then a planning activity program inspection. Yeah, thanks, Eric, and, and that's a good point. Uh, what you were mentioning that the you know the performance objectives aren't really different from what we already do now uh, on an ROP with performance indicators. Uh, so that's something to, uh, comforting that we're not changing things so drastically. It's a really an extension of, of a lot of things we already are doing and, and uh, we're very familiar with. And speaking of being familiar with, you know, I think about our oversight of of. Um, the radiological emergency preparedness programs for large light water reactors. This is something we've been doing uh, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency for over 40 years. Uh, we've been partnering and providing oversight of the on-site and off-site plans. Uh, and I'm sure many of you here today are very familiar with NRC roles and responsibilities, but how much do you know about our partners at FEMA? So can we have our next 
Live polling question up, please. I'm going to test your knowledge. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, performs what role in radiological emergency preparedness? Assists state, local, and tribal governments in the development of radiological emergency plans? Supports the evaluation of the emergency plans and preparedness of state, local, and tribal governments? Performs preliminary capabilities assessments and disaster-initiated reviews following significant events. Coordinates the national effort to support state, local, and tribal governments with relevant and executable radiological planning, training, and exercise guidance. Trains responders on the latest techniques and tools to respond to radiological hazards, or F all the above. And I think most of you got it. It's all the above. Uh, FEMA does quite a lot. And that partnership between NRC and FEMA uh, will continue into the future. And what I want to turn to next then, oh, can we go back to the slides, please? Is how our regulations build resilience. Again, as I was preparing for this, one of the definitions of resilience that I found defined it as the process and the outcome of successfully adapting to a situation. In EP, resilience isn't just something, a natural feature of the program. It's, it is the result of a deliberate process. And this process requires communication, coordination, and cooperation. So I'm now going to turn things over to Captain Janice McCarroll. And she's going to uh, discuss with us now uh, more about FEMA's role in radiological emergency planning and uh, how to build resilient communities. Janice? Oh, no small task. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> but I'm super excited because it looked like 83% really uh, knew, knew who FEMA was and what we do. So that is um, very reassuring. You know, I, I'm glad, Todd, that you mentioned um, last year's RIC, one I would never, ever miss a RIC, because this has got to be one of, I think, the best collaboration opportunities. Um, and it really does bring our entire community, our, I like to call it the nuclear enterprise. And, you know, my running joke is that it's not just because I'm a captain that I like talking about the enterprise. Um, I, you guys all get a little coin after that for laughing. Um, <laughs> oh, a few more coins. Okay, so uh, last year at the RIC, talked a little bit about our um, agency strategic goals, um, and, and they haven't changed. That's the, that's the lucky thing about strategic goals. Um, you can kind of continue to build on them. And so those remain to be um, equity, climate resilience, and a prepared nation. And I'll, I'll touch on all three of those, but, but it really ties back to what you guys have already laid out. Um, I find myself in the, the great position of kind of bringing us up to how, you know, where does radiological preparedness fall within national preparedness? And then I get to hand it over to my state colleagues who could really bring it home with what, what does that really mean to our communities. Um, and I want to emphasize that, that the radiological preparedness is, is a subset. It's part of a much larger national preparedness approach. And so when we talk about some of these resources and we talk about the approaches, um, this is, is part of a, it's a layer, right? We talk about um, defense and depth, but I mean, I would argue that this is, you know, this is a layer as part of our larger emergency management approach. And you also touched on the fact that uh, we've been doing this for, what, 40, 45 years? Um, I never try to do math up on the stage, but um, the radiological emergency preparedness program was one of the first, if not the first, emergency preparedness pro um, program that our brand new agency in 1979 um, had. So, you know, this really, the radiological approach ended up being really foundational when we look at what we now think of as a national uh, preparedness system. And um, I think that you you can see that, right? The, the DNA is fundamentally within um, our national approach when we talk about building capabilities and sustaining capabilities and validating capabilities. Todd, your, you know, your example from the Navy, I mean, that, that is exactly what we do um, across the threat and hazard space is um, work with our communities. One, it's a, it's a partnership. Uh, the, you know, the role of FEMA is very interesting. We're a federal agency, but we are a supporting entity. 
Um, it really, um, I, I like to say, like disasters, right? Preparedness starts and ends locally. And so we locally execute programs, we state support, but we, uh, excuse me, we state manage, but then federally support. Uh, and NRC and FEMA together are part of a much larger federal family that all um, work to build that overall preparedness. And it's important that when we talk about the language, um, and I feel like, okay, like Siri, start a timer. Um, because I can go on about this, and I want to make sure we have time for our state folks to talk. But um, you know, when we when we talk about the overall preparedness approach, it's so important that our language is similar because our communities aren't just dealing with a nuclear reactor in their space, and so. You know, whether you're a federal partner or whether you're a developer or whether you're an industry partner that already has this, this technology, working with that community right from the beginning is so important. And each community is so different. So trying to come up with kind of this, uh, you know, a, a, a one size fits all is, is kind of off, off brand at this point. Um, you know. I mentioned that equity is is kind of a cornerstone to to our, our current strategic goals, and it's I, I can't say that enough. It's recognizing your communities and what your communities need, and and kind of their unique challenges. It's all part of that uniqueness of each community. Um, I, I tried kind of going through. You know, we have states that have commercial nuclear power today. Um, you know, does that make that state, uh, you know, th they have a different knowledge base as, as you go in, to, you know, to have discussions about next generation nuclear technology. Um, but even if you're in a, in a radiological, a rep state, that doesn't mean that community is familiar with the radiological preparedness basis. And so, you know, I think not only do government and private sector and, and public sector Partners need an education, but it's it's really making sure that you're working with that community to understand that capability basis, because it all keeps coming back down to those capabilities. And again, if, um, I, I know I talked quite a bit about uh, the preparedness cycle last year. Um, FEMA.gov, it's a, it's a great cycle. There's some great you know uh, diagrams there that that can walk you through, but that really hits you know developing uh, those capabilities, sustaining those capabilities, making sure you've got a plan. And as you kind of raise up, look outside that fence line that we're talking about and making sure you understand what, is, what are the threats and hazards that that community has already identified as a basis for what the capabilities they need. Um, that's really important across that partnership. And we talk whole community is kind of a shorthand for that everybody needs to be at this table. And, and I heard that this morning um, during one of the round tables, just really, really powerful uh, to hear it both in a radiological sense, um, but recognizing that as that larger sense too. Um, a couple more things I just wanted to kind of emphasize. Todd talked about a bedrock for a changing landscape. Again, right in line with our preparedness and ultimately our resilience approach. Uh, 2024 is the year of resilience, as defined by our, our um, administrator. So I can't wait to talk to you a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, this, again, that, that this approach is consistent, and I would kind of challenge all of us to understand what those linkages are. Because, again, if you're only looking at the radiological footprint, I think you're leaving a lot of capabilities on the table, and you're not necessarily able to see um, one of our analogies, right? It's at that forest through the trees. I, I, I kind of challenge all of us across the board to just recognize that when we define a community, even a jurisdiction, that that really is so unique to each place. And so you, can't, you, you almost can't look at one state and then, and then just say, okay, well, great, that worked there. I'm now gonna go to another state. And again, not, not gonna go too, down, too, too far down the civics um, pathway, but to understand that we have very, very different um, environments that we're looking to, to uh, engage with uh, nuclear power uh, preparedness as well. Um, and, and again, I would love to talk a 
ton about um, emergency preparedness, both like EP specific to radiological, but also EP broader. I just want you to understand that that's really woven across our emergency management doctrine. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that it's the year of resilience. It's also one of our big strategies and, and kind of, again, one of our um, priorities is talking about place-based, uh, it's a place-based approach. And it, again, it's kind of meeting communities where they are. And I think that this is so in line with what we're talking about on our current reactors and, and looking into the future, right? Kind of the now and, um, and tomorrows. Um, and, and I think building off of a lot of these emergency management and emergency preparedness fundamental ideas is so important. And so, um, again, happy to talk a little bit more if we have time uh, during the Q&A about place-based technical assistance, but it's, it's really making sure that we're holistically looking across the threat and hazard spectrum. I think if we focus um, solely on the radiological spectrum, you, you don't necessarily see some of the tools and the, the, the capabilities that both federal partners, um, but then really across the board, um, really what, what do our states and locals have capability-wise to bring to bear, especially if, you've, if we're looking at, um, we are looking, right, like at these, a, a wide swath of opportunities as these folks come in with applications, right? Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to also emphasize is just, again, SMRs, I, I, I think um, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that uh, when we talk about this year of resilience. Um, but there's a couple of resources that I want to make sure that everybody um, is familiar with. And, and one of the areas that we've really seen uh, with FEMA is, is that we, we've, we've got some inequity in delivery of, of programs. Um, just feel like I'm going to pivot to, you know, w w this isn't radiologically specific, but I think that the radiological community can really um, build on this. And, and so there's some, some resources kind of coming out uh, this year, 2024, as the year of resilience. Um, to build on this concept that we rolled out last year, which are these um, communities of disaster uh, resilience zone, what we, what we call these um, CEDARS. I'll try not to use acronyms, but community disaster Res resilience zone, CDRZ. And, and Congress kind of challenged us to make sure that we're being equitable in, again, both program delivery, but just making sure that some of our traditionally underserved areas are getting the resources and, and are informed about some of the financial, you know, uh, thinking grants, but, you know, some of the financial, some of the other support systems that we've got in place. And I would just love to see that um, some of our developers and and, and federal partners and other partners all are aware of some of these initiatives to make sure that we're not leaving behind some of our communities um, that, that, again, we've kind of historically seen as underserved. We have a whole advocacy program within FEMA. Uh, we've just announced a, a new uh, senior uh, assigned to be the, uh, the small state and rural advocate. Again, kind of happy to talk to you guys about that in a little bit. Um, but want to make sure we also get the, uh, the the folks on the line. So last thing I'll mention is just we do have, in this year we're rolling out some uh, resilience guidance and you'll start to see that plugged in um, everywhere, not only at the program side, but also within our training um, and education programs that we put out with FEMA that working with all of our emergency management colleagues. Um, just. I will foot stomp that we don't do this alone. A whole community is definitely woven into our, uh, our, I was gonna say proverbial DNA. Um, and, and so when we talk about whole community, it's that the, the rubber meets the road at, at our state and local partners, right? I mean, I think as, as you'll hear um, from both Ken and um, Courtney, it's just, that's where a lot of this really meets the road. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Todd.
Great. Th thank you. I, you. You matched what I had in the question, that, that FEMA does a lot, oh. more than we realize. Uh, but a couple of things you, you were said uh, really struck me as you were talking, because you mentioned, you know, having a holistic view of all the hazards, not just being focused on the radiological. And that's, you know, I want to tie that back to what Eric said. There's some really innovative, smart features of our new rule. One is the hazard assessment of, uh, or hazard analysis of the contiguous facilities, okay? So we're, we're, we, we're concerned with the protection of the workers, not just from the risks of the radiation, but what else might be there on the facility, and what, what could uh, limit uh, implementation of the radiological emergency plan? So, so thank you for that, Janice. Um, now, next up, I want to have some more perspectives from off-site organizations. And so to, to tee us up for that, uh, can we have the next live polling question, please? The first question related to emergency planning zones asking, protective actions could be needed outside unestablished emergency planning zone. And the answer to that is true, because the way we use the, the emergency planning zone in our regulations is it's a planning tool, okay? It ensures that you have some initial planning in which you can take some predetermined prompt protective actions. But it's a risk-informed construct. That is, there is, it's unlikely, but there's some potential that you could exceed uh, protective action guides outside the EPZ. And so what the planning does, it makes sure you have capabilities in place that you can extend your protective actions outside the emergency planning zone uh, as needed. Um, can we have the next question, please? Offsite authorities will not perform an independent assessment of potential radiological impacts until a licensee issues a protective action recommendation. True or false, does the offsite wait on the licensee to act. And I think many of you are getting that, that's false. Uh, state and locals are their own authorities and they're the ones with the responsibility to make decisions for p public health and safety. And so I'd like to turn now, if we can go back to our slide. <clears throat> we have with us Ken Evans online. Ken, are you there? I'm here, Todd. Hi, Ken. Glad you could join us today. So Ken. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, for over 40 years, the success of the Radiological Emergency Preparedness Program for large light water reactors uh, that was built on the communication, coordination, cooperation between uh, the on-site and off-site response organizations. As you reflect on the changing landscape of nuclear, in what areas can we evolve in our approach to EP, and what are the fundamentals that never change? Well, again, Thank you, Todd, for uh, the invitation and for the, the Rick here. And uh, I just want to say, too, thank you for uh, scheduling or sequencing the, the speakers the way you did, because uh, I'm going to be referring uh, back to some of the comments that have already uh, been made about flexibility and about uh, partnerships. And uh, the only difficulty I have in answering the question that you pose and if some of the things have already been indicated is that one size does not fit all. Uh, all states are not the same. Mm -hmm. And as my uh, years with uh, CRCPD and working with uh, different states, I found out just how much of a difference there is. And also, as we talk about the uh, rule and the flexibility for uh, the developers is they uh, do their risk analysis and hazard analysis. Uh, one size does not uh, fit all. So that being said, I think that as we go to these new technologies and these uh, so-called SMRs, why, uh, the, uh, it's going to depend a lot on the uh, availability of resources that you have in the particular jurisdiction that you're going to be uh, uh, constructing this uh, SMR, if you will. Um, and even if you look at the hazard is being uh, much less as far as, and you know, I know the rule has the one rem uh, TED dose in there as being a uh, criteria for determining if you're going to, uh, you know, need to have an EPZ, so to speak. But even if you don't need to have the EPZ, 
there is still the radiological aspect to consider, and that gets into the uh, uh, does the entity, uh, and I'm talking about here now, the local, state, local, county, have the resources to monitor for radiological um, um, detriment, if you will. And you don't necessarily have to exceed uh, the EPA pegs. In fact, somebody mentioned about ingestion earlier and about the concept there. So there is a much lower threshold to needing to monitor for ingestion related activities. And depending on the jurisdiction, and again, this has just been brought home uh, quite well, it depends on what resources you may have locally already established just because you have an all-hazard plan. If you have not developed an all-hazard plan that takes into account uh, radiological risk, then um, you know there is a concern about how that is going to be funded. But um, I could go on and on and on, but I know we're short on time, so I'm going to stop now. Oh, Ken, I think we're doing great on time, and I, I appreciate that uh, thorough response. Um, and I think, you know, again, just touching on uh, ingestion planning, another real key innovation of the rule focusing on capabilities over prescriptive distances, I think, because that's where we see uh, emergency preparedness really shines in those capabilities. Uh, Ken, we know emergency planning zones, we talked about in the question, they're, they're planning tools uh, to help us scope the planning efforts, but they don't limit response response capabilities, that's a key. They, they, they bound the initial planning, but they don't bound the response. And nor do they impact state and local responsibility for um, protecting public health and safety. So how would planning for radiological mercies be addressed uh, under all hazards? That is, if there's not a formal rep program offsite. Well, uh, again, that gets back uh, to, I think, some of my previous comments. If uh, and again, I'll use the example of an entity, uh, you know, uh, off-site response organization, if you will, where they may have an all-hazard plan, but they have not uh, developed a plan that might include a potential radiological hazard. Now, I, I think that one of the things that can be said with these uh, smaller reactors and uh, much reduced source terms and time to take actions, probably the uh, all hazard planning would be more than adequate. In, in other words, it's not like you're going to need an alert and notification system for a small modular reactor. I mean, that, that probably is not going to be required. So. Uh, any immediate actions for the public obviously could be handled under an all hazard plan. However, what the all hazard plan may not include is what are the protocols for working with our uh, federal, if you will, partners or uh, private entities to have increased radiological monitoring capabilities. And some of the uh, jurisdictions out there um, that may not be even aware of, and I'll, I'll use the, um, the FERMAC here, Federal Radiological Monitoring and Assessment Center, uh, maybe they don't even know about what capabilities some of the federal entities can bring to the table. So there, there obviously has to be some development and coordination efforts uh, if, if something like this is going to be uh, established in a jurisdiction that previously has not had a nuclear facility. Thanks, Ken. My last question to you is, uh, what can states do now to prepare for small modular reactors and other new technologies? Well, uh, I would say this probably it, it is going to depend on the um, individual state. And I, I guess if I may set Courtney up a little bit here, 
because I know she's going to follow me. Uh, and in my time in uh, Illinois, I did work with uh, Indiana extensively on what we had ingestion exercises. So uh, I would say that if you look at a rep state, and of course, uh, a lot of people know that Illinois has more reactors than any other state. So um, as far as preparations, there's, there's probably not a lot of preparations a state like uh, Illinois would need to do, if, if I may use that as an example, if you are already prepared for, um, you know, six different sites with basically 11 units operating, uh, you probably can handle another SMR uh, without any additional resources. Very, very few additional sources. I mean, the templates and, uh, you know, response organizations, uh, equipment is already in place. However, if you move into a state like Indiana, and I don't want to take away too much of Courtney's uh, material here, so I'm going to let her elaborate on it. But if, if the state does not have uh, existing arrangements, equipment, uh, plans, procedures, uh, then there's going to need to be more lead time for them to develop their resources. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Ken. So Ken, as you can tell, represents decades uh, of experience and wisdom uh, in emergency preparedness. And of course, we have a lot of smart people in all the states that know all hazards preparedness. But we're mentioning, you know, not every state and not every community is, uh, has radiological hazards in that. So what we're going to do now is turn to the state of Indiana, which happens to be my home state. Now, as a native Hoosier, that means I'm allowed to poke a little fun at my state because, you know, when people think of Indiana, they tend to think of a flat landscape with nothing but cornfields. But that's actually not reality. Um, actually, Indiana is a very beautiful state. In the north, we have beaches, we have rolling hills. If you go to the south, there's uh, lush forests. Uh, and, and many things uh, in, in Indiana are very rich. And the, the energy landscape is in Indiana is also changing. Uh, as I drive through the, the middle of the state now, you'll see windmills dotting the cornfields, OK? And then if you were following the news, you know that I believe it was last year or the year before, Indiana is opening the door now to, to nuclear. Uh, and so I've asked Courtney to join us to help us understand from um, you know, a, a newcomer state's perspective, how does the changing nuclear landscape uh, is, uh, impact you? So Courtney, um, let me start off. Uh, Indiana is, is um, opening the door to nuclear, but you do participate in radiological emergency preparedness now. Can you can you describe us a little bit um, how you how you participate in REP? Yeah, so currently Indiana is only an ingestion pathway state, and that's only our 11 most northern counties. Um, but we still try to participate with our plants that we would fall in the ingestion pathway zone, um, and their plume exercises or their HAB exercises, just to get a better understanding, stay connected with our stakeholders and stay checked up on our skills. Um, and we work a lot with our neighboring states, Illinois and Michigan, as Ken said earlier. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and if you weren't aware too, uh, in that the, the northern states were preparing for a, a big exercise next year, Cobalt Magnet 25, that's gonna involve uh, many of the states and also uh, across national co uh, coordination, cooperation, communication, all the things I'm talking about here. Uh, so we'll be demonstrating those capabilities uh, next year. Next question uh, to you, Courtney, is how is Indiana uh, individually preparing for the changing landscape of nuclear power? Yeah, um, so just actually to go off the exercise that you were talking about earlier, we are participating in that and we're doing it in not traditional rep counties. So that's already, we're starting off trying to train everyone um, from the ground up in rep and it's definitely kind of been a challenge because we don't traditionally train there. Um, so there's a first challenge for us already. And then going to a broader spectrum, um, Indiana Office of Energy Development has announced um, and requested proposals for SMR reactors in Indiana. Um, they wanna analyze their potential impact if they were deployed in the state and or if they were developed in Indiana. And I know Purdue University and Duke Energy also completed a study last year um, on a similar topic. Uh, Indiana is also in the process of becoming an agreement state 
Um, when I started in Indiana in 2021, there were two of us. It was me and my former boss. Um, we've now grown the team over the past years to nine, and that includes five new health physicists. And we're cross-training our health physicists with our nuclear response team. So if anything were to happen, we have the technical expertise around our boots on, alongside our boots on the ground operations. Um, and that way we have the big brains in there um, explaining things if needed and all the boots on the ground, boots on the ground stuff that we need. And then as of this week, we have seven radiological operational support specialist Rosses um, at the state level in Indiana. And that's great for us because they can serve as subject matter experts and sit down with our policymakers and explain anything um, for people who don't work in radiation every day. We've also been working a lot with our public information office to get more positive stories out about our radiation team um, out in the community and as well as training our first responders, not just in rapid already radiation or nuclear emergencies, um, but the past six months, we've trained over 200 first responders in rep, radiation basics, um, hospital training, radioactive transportation, and radiation nuclear detection operations. Uh, we really believe that a strong foundation um, of education is how we're going to move forward in the nuclear world. Um, our governor is even involved. He visited Darlington Nuclear Generating Station in Ontario recently um, and met with officials in Ontario about their energy transition and discussed opportunities um, for power energy generation and storage innovations. And then specifically with REP right now, we are redoing all of our sampling plans because as we've been going through them and training these non-traditional REP counties, we've realized there's a lot of holes in our plans, which is great to figure out now, we'll fix them. Um, and then we get a chance to test it next year. And we've also finally solidified communications between all of our surrounding states and who's gonna call who during a radiation emergency. And I know that sounds small, but we're very happy that we have that finally nailed down in place. Well, well that's great, Courtney, Th thanks for that. You know, and, and everything you, you rattled off there, uh, one, uh, with the growth and in, in the staff and the number of HPs, uh, that's uh, that's remarkable in itself. Uh, good for you. And it sounds like it's a very much a whole community, whole state approach in preparing for for nuclear. Um, I'm reminded, um, you know, last year we we familiarized ourselves with some um, some efforts in Virginia. There's a Virginia innovative nuclear hub that's also seeking to expand um, nuclear in the state, and it's a it's a um, grassroots effort from the ground up and you know, with K through 12 education, college education, workforce development. So it's exciting to see a lot of the states um, looking ahead to the changing landscape and preparing. Um, but with that, we know there's gonna be some challenges. So what challenges do you face in adopting new tech, nuclear technology in the state that you know, traditionally has not had reactors? Yeah, so first we have to start with education. And I'm really lucky because I have a very great team that we built and we all work in radiation every day, but we still have to educate our executive team. And, <clears throat> sorry, as I spoke earlier, the governor is also involved, so educating like those officials as well. Um, and then persuading local communities who have never had a power plant in their backyard and how that's gonna work. And we think that having specific trainings or education for the public, local first responders, local law enforcement, including conservation officers, um, on the enhanced safety features of SMRs, basics of radiation, how SMRs work, and then proceed with other aspects from there. Um, maybe even having a can dots, presentation, stuff on social media. Uh, it goes on by just getting the information out. Um, and as we've said a lot of, many times today already, Indiana has never had a traditional EPZ. So this is all new to us. We'd have to start from the ground up planning wise um, and working with our partner agencies to get them caught up on everything in the developing nuclear world. Um, and Indiana, it's it's still a rural, rural state. It still has small towns. There's still a lot of volunteer fire departments who can only train when they have the time. Or if something were to happen, maybe one, two, three guys could respond. And that's one of that's a big concern I have um, with our local first responders, just making sure that they feel comfortable responding with two people if we're three hours away in Indianapolis versus it happening maybe in a bigger city um, outside Chicago, outside of Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, stuff like that. Great, great, thanks for that, Courtney. And then specific to radiological emergency preparedness, what, what challenges or opportunities do you see? Um, there has been a lot of turnover. I'm sure you all have felt it. A lot of turnover in jobs. Hmm. Um, we've lost a lot, of, a lot of retirement since COVID. We've lost a lot of knowledge from our first responders. Um, and training a new person in rep is not easy and not straightforward. 
when I started in Indiana, I was the rep coordinator and I was in that position for maybe a year and a half before I got promoted to director. And then I had to hire a new rep coordinator and us learning together. We've decided it takes about two years before you feel like you're not drowning in information and then you feel like you have a solid footing. Um, we're also very lucky uh, in Indiana that we have FEMA, FEMA Region 5 and our FEMA reps are fantastic and have educated us so much and have been there the whole way, but it's still definitely a challenge. Um, and we're trying to tra train everyone to kind of meet their own standard because a lot of feedback we get from our local first responders, law enforcement, EMA, healthcare, hazmat, is that everything's kind of a general training to radiation and they want more specific to what they work in. So that's something we're working on now. Um, always communication with all levels of government from local up to federal um, and in between different federal partners to communicate with us and with each other. Um, and then to be more proactive in trainings and more proactive in communications, not reactive. We can't wait until something happens to form a plan. So that's what we're trying to do is try to get as many, as much as we can in place in case something does happen. Um, not exchanging business cards when there's an emergency because nobody wants to do that. Great, thanks for that, Courtney. You know, hearing, hearing you talk about the challenges you face, it's, it's, I don't know if it's comforting is the right word, but it's, it's uh, we, we share many of the similar challenges. So for example, yesterday, and we talked a lot about knowledge management and how do we deal with retiring staff. And so I think this is something we're all faced, but we can, this is an area where we can cooperate and work together uh, and find solutions for, for workforce development and uh, help prepare for this future together. And I think, uh, you know, the, the message um, we heard, thank you, Courtney, from, from you and from, from Ken and from Janice is, is again, you know, Communication, coordination, cooperation, those are essential to this whole community pro approach to preparedness. Thank you. Can we go back to the slides, please? This actually brings me down to the, the summary of our session. Um, the landscape is changing, but as you've uh, just heard in the past hour or half so, um, we've adapted to the changing landscape with a new framework for emergency preparedness. It's a flexible framework uh, it's technology inclusive and it provides many ways you can meet our regulatory requirements. And importantly, the regulations are uh, one part of the approach to preparedness that builds resilient communities able to protect public health and safety. So we thank you for listening. If you can, please uh, give our speakers a round of applause here for a minute. So I think we've saved uh, some plenty of time for some questions and again, a reminder, um, you can ask your question online uh, if you're joining us through the QA or if you're in the room, if you join us through the app, please submit your question uh, and we'll get to them. Um, first question I have, Eddie, I want to start with you. Um, there were so many things that we did um, you know, to prepare for this final rule. What, what, are we, what are we doing to prepare ourselves to review applications in the NRC? Um, it's recognized collectively um, the agency and the applicants are in an ever-changing environment. Um, from what we've heard today um, in relation to 5160, um, this rulemaking was developed to be uh, technology inclusive and as such uh, the staff does anticipate uh, design specific methodologies uh, to be developed. Um, Todd, as you pointed out earlier, um, although the staff had methodically worked through some of these very difficult concepts and concepts um, during the 5160 rulemaking process, uh, the staff continues to verify guidance and undergo training efforts uh, to ensure connectivity for future nuclear, uh, new reactor activities. Um, internal to the Division of Preparedness and Response, we are in the midst of developing an EP specialist, specialist qualification card one of those qualification areas is the staff's recognition of the various cross-cutting technical reviews uh, between existing large light water reactors and advanced and new reactor licensing efforts. And this includes uh, the recognition and understanding of the specific regulations that correlate to those review efforts uh, to ensure regulatory stability and consistency in the application review process. Uh, infrastructure development is another preparation tool in which a division of preparedness and response is, is developing. Um, and that's a, uh, another preparation tool um, 
that were undertaken to better position the staff to be successful at the onset of application receipt of advanced and new reactor application submittals. Uh, for, in for instance, a strategy tool is being developed to better inform the staff's review of applications submitted under 5160 for the purpose of compliance with performance-based emergency preparedness. Uh, the division is also hosting knowledge management training sessions led by our technical experts on concepts related to various program elements of 5160, including but not limited to uh, event classification and mitigation and staffing and operations and what that may look like for SMRs, non-light water reactors and non-power production and utilization facilities licensed under 10 CFR 5160. So we continue to perfect the licensing process internally, but I wanna make it clear that we're per certainly stand in a ready um, state uh, for application receipt. Um, Great, th thank you for that, Eddie. I just wanna emphasize as we're talking about adapting to that changing landscape, you know, it's one thing to have a final rule and it's another thing to ask uh, the states what they're doing to prepare, the licensees what they're doing to prepare. I just wanted to, to emphasize that the NRC, we still are, are continuing to um, prepare ourselves to review these applications so we review them in an efficient and timely manner uh, and that we can um, come to reasonable assurance determination. So uh, a lot of good work I know is, ha is happening to prepare us for that. Um, the next question uh, is, is, a, is a licensing question maybe for you, Adam, or, or for you, Eric. Um, has to do with, you know, at what point in the licensing process is certain information needed? And so the, the question would be um, specific to emergency planning zones for early site permits. And is it appropriate or reasonable to expect an EPZ to be defined at the ESP stage? For me? Whoever, Eric or Eddie? Uh, so you tag team. You tag team. Go first from your perspective or? All right. <laughs> Um, well, as far as the, the early site permit piece, um, that's coming under, you know, uh, our regulations in Part 52 process. Um, so essentially from a design perspective or from a construction permits piece, you got to look at, and this is just me talking now, you got to look at the construction permit stage is pro providing the preliminary safety evaluation kind of safety analysis report. So for all intensive purposes, that's the straw man of what the applicant plans to do. Um, then you have the operating license, which provides like the final safety analysis report. For all intensive purposes, that's the soup to nut approach um, for all the uh, emergency planning details, uh, the functionality requirements, et cetera. So for the early site permit, it also depends on the complete and integration of that. So you would have that EPZ sizing um, captured in there and the details related to that at the ESP stage under Part 52. Anything to add here? Um, a, a little bit. I, I think it would be incumbent upon the applicant to determine exactly how much finality they want and how far they've come with the ESP. Part of the reasoning behind it, getting an ESP is you may not know exactly what your design is or you may not have um, matured your design far enough to have all those types of answers. So if, you're, if you want that much finality to have the EPZ um, size determination finalized, then that would be an option for you, but it would take a greater amount of design certainty to do that um, as, as far as whether or not it would be a, a good idea or, or, or a bad idea. I, that would be you know, completely up to the applicant. We can, we can deal with it, whether it's at the ESP stage. Um, TVA came in and they only gave us a methodology mm -hmm. to determine what their EPZ size is. So we looked at the methodology and made comments and, and ended up approving their methodology, but that methodology doesn't include any type of specific EPZ size. So. There's a lot of flexibility with the ESP, and it would all be based on the maturity of the design and exactly how much finality a, uh, a given applicant would be looking for. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question, or maybe it's a comment, um, concerning the demonstration of capabilities in drills and exercises and the associated tracking metrics, it's worth mentioning that NEI engaged the NRC on this topic and developed an approach uh, reviewed in public meeting last year that would likely be found acceptable in an application. Would you like to comment? 
I'm likely to be found acceptable. That, that, uh, that document that was pr uh, presented to us wasn't presented to us for endorsement. That's so, I, I, think I, I think I would stop short of saying likely to be approved for, by us. I think that if, a, uh, if an applicant wanted to use that, um, I think that they're off to a good start. Um, but they would need to make certain that that, that document is, is tailored to their specific situation. And there's, there's a lot in that document that, um, that would need to be fleshed out as far as the specifics of uh, what, that, uh, what that drill and exercise program would look like. Then it, it wouldn't necessarily be um, generic to, to any SMR or ONT or small modular reactor um, or micro reactor. For that point. You know, I, I, considering this comment, I actually think back to what um, the chair said yesterday. We're an independent agency, but we don't act in isolation. And I think to me, what, what, I, what excites me about um, just approaching us with these ideas is that we see engagement from everyone, not just the work of the regulator, but the industry, the states. Everybody's gearing up for this, to adapt to this changing landscape and is proposing solutions. So this is very encouraging. Um, you know, Eddie, you mentioned a lot of the topical reports that we've already reviewed and worked on, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're all working toward the same goal here, which is exciting. And, you know, I'll even mention, um, uh, this goes back a number of years, and the NRC has a study where we looked at what does risk-informed performance-based EP look like, and we published that. And so there's a lot of resources and good thinking that's out there, and I think that those are going to be other tools that we can use to help us uh, achieve this future. And the next question, uh, is an is owner-operator of a small modular reactor obligated to train and support local responders under this new rule? Um, yeah. Um, so basically, one of the things that we are going to look at from a licensing perspective is the training aspects um, of this small modular owner and reoperate, you know, owner. Um, as far as not only what the training aspects look like, um, for that specific facility and unique to that site, but also uh, how often is the training occurring, um, the exercise and uh, uh, periodicity of that um, for those training requirements, um, where, how are, um, from the exercises, uh, how are lessons learned um, from that being incorporated to any type of procedural aspects of it. So these are things that we're actually looking at and we continue to look at. We looked at those um, when, um, from our past regulation, not past, but our other pre-existing regulations in 5047 space, as well as Appendix C. We'll continue to look at that under 5160 as well um, on those training, qualification, and then actually exercise requirements. Thanks, Eddie. Janice, I think uh, this next one might be for you. If requested, can FEMA Tech Hazards Division provide technical planning assistance to a community near a small modular reactor if that facility does not have an emergency planning zone that extends beyond the site boundary? For example, can THC provide help with a thyra or review local procedures to identify recommended improvements or raise awareness of federal response resources? Wow, that's like not a loaded question at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have a short answer. Um, currently, our authorization um, is, is very much tied to uh, the, the current light water reactor fleet, right? So we bill industry directly for that work. And so if it's for a utility that's not already being billed, I don't know that the technological hazards, if it's a radiologically specific um, review or support, but that's not to say that FEMA can't provide technical assistance. So there's a little bit of a nuance there. I think the, spe the specificity of using um, technological hazards, uh, which leads me to believe that it's a headquarters entity. Some of our regions use that designation, but not all of them. So um, 
I think that that's probably, I'd, I'd have more questions than, than answers to that, but the, the, the short answer is we'd, we'd use FEMA authorities for something that was not, is not currently part of our billing process, if that helps. Thanks. Um, one thing that was mentioned, you know, workforce challenges, and uh, I can't remember if it was mentioned or not, but the idea of the, of the ROS, the Radiation Operations Support, support Specialist. So I thought maybe um, Ken and Janice, if you could, um, can you briefly describe uh, what, what the ROS program is and what that can bring to a community? Oh, no, absolutely. Oh. And I'm going to um, turn to Ken as, as soon as he's ready to receive the ball, but I think that's a great question. Well, I, I already caught the ball. <laughs> so. I'll go ahead. Uh, it, and, I, and I believe that uh, Courtney may have mentioned this in her presentation, but the Ross, the Radiation Radiological Operations Support Specialist, is something that was uh, created a number of years ago, and there's been effort to uh, do the credentialing, the training, and uh, certification of these individuals, but uh, the simplest way to uh, uh, state what the purpose of this is, is that the recognition is that even in a state such as Illinois that has extensive resources, if there was ever a major radiological incident, you simply don't have enough staff to uh, basically handle the emergency. So with these radiological operation support specialists or Ross if you will, it would be additional resources that could be brought in to uh, augment your your resources. And one of the things that, and Rolf has been actually demonstrated at a number of uh, national level exercises. I know there was an extensive use of it at Southern Exposure back in uh, 15, and uh, there's been other numerous exercises where uh, this concept was uh, actually proven. And the idea behind the ROS too is, is I think Courtney may have mentioned in her presentation, is that when you have counties or entities that may not be familiar with dealing with radiation, it helps to have what I call a translator. The ROS hopefully is a translator that would say, okay, here's some of the resources out here that you can use. I mentioned, I use Fermac as an example in my presentation and it, the Ross would uh, up and say, okay, you can, here's what the Fermac can do for you. Another example would be, uh, here's what the advisory team can do. Uh, you need to use the advisory team uh, to answer some of these questions. So uh, again, the Ross is just a, a, an excellent resource that would be available. And, uh, you know, it could either come from the same state or it could come from either an adjoining state, depending on the uh, extent of the emergency. Thanks for that, Ken. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so if I could briefly, um, outside of rulemaking, public um, participation and rulemaking process. How is the NRC engaged with the public and stakeholders on this new rule? Well, I, I know myself, I've, I've given a, a few presentations. Um, most recently, this past fall, I was in Idaho Falls speaking to the Western States in a, uh, Energy Board. Um, in Idaho Falls, there's uh, Idaho um, INL, so they're, they're a community that's uh, familiar with radiological um, emergency preparedness and that, so they were, they were happy to have the presentation and, and, and talk about what's, what's new and how the new rule could be used in uh, potentially their, their area. Um, I think it was about two years ago, I think, about three years ago, I did a, uh, well, in fact, we co-authored a paper, um, and I, deli I was fortunate enough to be the one to deliver it in Vienna at a technical information conference. 
and that was speaking to you know a large international audience about how it is that we were, at that time it was a proposed a proposed final rule, but uh, how we how we got to where we were at and and how we were looking forward to um, having the commission uh, approve that rule. Oh, thanks, Eric. And Janice, I'll just speak for us briefly because I know Janice and I went up and addressed the Nuclear Energy Advisory Council in the state of Connecticut at their invitation, and we got to uh, explain our rules and new rules to them. Um, and so a lot of these efforts are continuing. And, and as Eric mentioned, um, a lot of international engagement. We've been hearing that in a lot of these sessions. Um, we've had lots of opportunity to engage with NEA uh, and also um, uh, IAEA on uh, what is what is emergency preparedness for small modular reactors and how new technologies look like. So with that, please uh, join me again in uh, giving a round of applause. Our <laughs> and this will close our session. Thank you. Is Courtney a Purdue alum? Yeah. No. Yeah. Sorry, what looked like a Purdue oh, jersey in the back of uh, in our background. Oh, Hoosiers. Well, Hoosiers are boiling. Is she? another funding question. I don't want to get that on tape. <laughs> All right, I'm going to walk around just so I don't jump off the... Hey, sir. Good to see you in person. Yeah, finally.
Ann. How are you, buddy? Is it Ben or Benjamin? Ben. Ben, okay. All right. Good. You go by Rob or Robert? Uh, Rob. Usually. Rob, yeah. okay. It's funny, I always say Robert Cox rather than Rob Cox. It yeah. sounds too short. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. But everybody calls him Rob. Yeah, I'm trying... I'm trying to figure out if I can. Um, they spelled my name wrong, so now I'm trying to figure out if there's like any email where they where they wrote this okay. and I just didn't catch it. Okay. I think they just mess. I think they're just doing it to mess with me. Okay. So, I'm like, well, that's fun. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see. This will be a fun. Playing Dr. Cox, uh, they got the slides. I'm, I'm just checking up on one thing. Um, okay. And I'll have, I might have them. I'll ask them if they want me to do it. But there's like one clicker. But I don't okay. know if you guys just can't need a clicker down the row. So okay. Just probably take care of you. The next slide will take care of that. Okay. No problem. Um, and you know, Rob will have the questions for you guys. Okay. Confidence monitor right in front of you. Yeah. Um, are we are we sitting? Are we going up? What uh, is our plan? No. You, yeah. You got the microphones here. You can stay right we'll here. Sit. So okay. and the camera will just focus on you. Okay. So you have to. Okay. Just take it easy. You can take your shoes off. I think maybe no, nobody will notice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, they can see me. Hey, oh well, maybe you can. Yeah. So <laughs> everybody else can. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, only just to confirm if you if you intentionally did that to mess with me. Is uh. H O L T Z. I, I would have copy pasted. So maybe I might. I don't know. Um, so I did not mess with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's fine because we have something to ask about. So it, it's not it's not even the first uh, mistake already for this presentation for this session. So um, Nicole is a brand chief, not a well, she's listed as a brand chief, but she's acting director. I'm not sure was that always like that or is she, that's something more new. Um, and I'll, it's I'll, been a couple months. I'll it's been that. a few months. So yeah, yeah, I think the slot. I think I mean my slides are fine on it. I think on the website it looks right. Okay. Uh, this is the first. This, I think this is the only time I've see, I saw it. So okay. That's so on the website, for you as a presenter, it shows up correctly. I believe so. Okay. Can Slides. I find Dead Bones? Yeah. yeah, that would be him. Oh, Ozzy. check the. Oh, you find Dead Bones? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Are you the tech guy? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, H O L T, right? Yeah. T Z. Okay. 
Can I check the accommodation? Like if it gets changed and it's another new different spelling, then that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's right on the website. That's a, so. So it looks like like I don't think these don't look like they turn off, so they're all live. So just yeah. Be, okay. That's the other thing I've noticed. And normally, like in the commission room, you can push the button and it right. it'll turn it off. But so it looks like it'll be live. So okay. So don't sneeze into the mic. Well, yeah. Or. <laughs> You know, don't, don't, don't groan online. at what I say. <laughs> I, I read your slides. I'll, 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 I'll tease it. Right. Right. Oh, like, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. There's a reason why I only have four slides. Like, <laughs> like, we, we, like, we like our pictures, yep. and then we, yep. we, talk about, we talk about the pictures, yep. tell the story. So, you know, that'll be, that'll be good. Yeah. I think, I think this will be, I think it'll be an interesting session. We'll, yeah. we'll see. I had to practice it to get, make sure I was actually at 10 minutes a couple times. Yeah. Um, but I think we'll have, hopefully we'll get some good Q&A. I, I think so, yeah. Out, but. I, I actually think I'm at seven, seven and a half. I think Nicole said she was about eight. So, okay. you know, we were okay with saying if you're slightly all going to work. Okay. It'll all work out. Um, right. So, and then, uh, yeah, I think it'll be, hopefully it'll be good Q&A. Rob's got the list of the ones that we had prepared, but hopefully we don't even have to use them. And, Get good questions coming in. So, yeah. what, was, what was your role again? So, right, so I'm a I'm a branch chief in our region one okay. office. Okay. Uh, so I'm typically more in the operating reactor oversight okay. world. Okay. Um, last year I was on rotation into our advanced reactor division, and one of the projects I was leading was uh, looking at our construction oversight process okay. and working with the team that was doing that. Okay. Um, so when I went back to region one at the end of it, I kind of begged. My boss, Mo and Rob, I said, "Can I? I'd okay. like to stick with this." And I think, you know, I bring in some of the operating reactor oversight concepts. Like, you know, you know, it, 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 I think I was able to leverage that a little bit. So, um, and and then we wouldn't lose any momentum by having a change in okay. the team. And they obliged, so I get to okay. stay in, involved in advanced reactors a little bit. Very good. So, right. That'll be. I think that'll be good. It'll, it'll be nice to have have you able to maintain some momentum yeah. and, and drive this. I know there was, you know, I, I think we want. I think originally we were hoping for it to start a little earlier, if I yeah. remember the timelines correctly. Um, but you know, this this is I think the right time in terms of the development of projects yeah. for us to try to start figuring this this piece out, just because we're going to start being in construction. You know, sooner rather than later, yeah. right? CPAs yeah. started are going. Kairos is ready in, but like won't be eight RDPs or I think yep. maybe this year. Yep. And then, yep. you know, that'll that's when we're gonna have to have some something at least figured out, even if it's not perfect. Of like, okay, well, what's yeah. what are what are we all anticipating? How do we? How do now, we do this? now it's interesting. So Kairos and ACU they won't use this oversight process yeah. since they're um, since they're RTRs, but. Right. It's certainly a good live case study to, to test out some of the concepts, right? Yeah. And, and so whether it's, hey, you're doing it in parallel, you're not, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at where we're taking what that inspection team is doing and then saying well, what it would look like here. Yeah. Uh, because even though it's an RTR, I mean, the, it's, the risk, it's about the size the, right, and, I mean, the and size, profile the risk, the, right, yeah, of the isn't all that Robert, different. pleasure to meet you in person. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's... Uh, you know, an important aspect, right, is we have to look at this and say, like, well, what are, um, you know, some of the best practices yeah. and lessons learned that we can gain not only from the existing fleet, of, you know, of construction um, aspects, but also, you know, the RTRs, yeah. the, you know, international, How are you? all yep. sorts of things. Because there's such a diversity of what yeah. new yeah. nuclear looks like that all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, a micro, you know, a or, micro reactor may look much But you might want the picture the while RTR, you're sitting so, there. Oh, yeah. You know, how do we right, so you need to get somebody in the audience to process that's okay. the right size. Yep. Yeah. yep. Yeah, 100%. And we are doing some of that. We're doing some of the external Stay tuned. But we're missing you know, Nicole. Like, yeah. Right now, our okay. CNSC, you know, to see what they're over. The only thing I can't see is like, yeah. yeah. It's painful. It's amazing. There's some, there's some differences. Um, um, but, you know, um, so it'll be... And, and in some of the models, right? The, the differences from you know, being in like you know, high where it's your own operator sort of thing. They, they have a lot. Of, their jurisdiction over what they do. They, you know, industrial safety is part of their purview too, right? Whereas right. NRC, you know, OSHA, you know, is that, right? We're only about nuclear safety. Um, so there's some differences, but I think there's still some things we can learn. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's... You just got to find the fine balance. Yeah. No, I think that's the right approach for it. I figured they didn't want me to have an open glass up here. <laughs> it's common cause failure. Just mm -hmm. spill the water everywhere. Yeah. All the mics short yeah. out. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I assume you're, Thank you. you're based here in the D.C. area? Then? Yep. Yeah, so I'm, I'm down in... Uh, by, I'm right over by Capitol Hill. Um, okay. the Lincoln Park area. Okay. So, all right. Just maintain all the visits. So, yeah, it's not too bad. I just had to, uh, um, I just drive up essentially to come up to here. Try to avoid going to the office because um, most of the time uh, I'm just doing stuff either virtually or you know on like individually anyway. Um, like I go in when they're when like everyone else is coming in. And it's right. like okay, we're gonna do an in-person collaboration an or something like that. Yeah. And it's like sure, happy to do it. But I'm like I don't. Useful sometimes to be able to chat.